December 26, 1997, during the early morning hours in East Bremerton, Washington, a neighbor notices smoke coming from the H&E residence and alerts the other neighbors. It doesn't take too long before a 911 call is made and authorities rush their way to the scene. Authorities arrived and got the fire under control, only to then make a grueling discovery, which was accompanied by a smell of burning flesh that made them fear the worst. Inside, they unfortunately find the body of a 28-year-old woman who neighbors immediately recognize as that of Dawn Hatchney. Her husband, Nick Hatchney, had gone for a hunting trip with friends and at around 10 a.m. He came back home with their dog only to find the house had been on fire and his wife had died as a result of it. Initially ruled as an accidental fire, a gruesome discovery would be made years later and would reveal that something far more sinister was behind it. This is the heartbreaking case of Don Hatchney. Dawn Marie Tienhara was born on December 5, 1969, in Seattle, Washington, to Donald Tienhara and Diana Parmel. Donald worked in a shipyard while Diana took care of the home. Dawn was their eldest child and only daughter, and together grew up with her three brothers, Dennis, Darren, and Derek in Bremerton, Washington. According to her mother, her devoutness began at an early age, with her embracing faith and accepting the Lord into her life when she was four years old. Dawn faced hardships in her childhood due to her parents' struggles with anxiety and depression that would often lead to frequent conflicts. Around 1980, Diana met a new man, prompting her departure from the family to move in with him. This led to the arrival of another baby. However, the relationship hit a snag, forcing Diana, alongside her newborn, to return to Donald and her other children. Despite these childhood obstacles she faced, Dawn turned all her challenges into doing well in school, dedicating herself to achieving excellent grades. At just 12 years old, she had participated in the Scripps National Spelling Bee, an opportunity that not only led her to the White House, but also allowed her to meet the late former president, Ronald Reagan. In 1988, Dawn graduated and achieved the honor of being the valedictorian at Bremerton Christian School before joining the Northwest College of the Assemblies of God in Seattle. During her college years, she crossed paths with Nick Hachney, and an instant connection sparked between them. However, concerns arose among Dawn's friends when she referred to Nick as the One after just a few dates. They hoped their friend would find a companion who embraced her with unwavering support and genuine affection, expressing apprehension about Nick as they perceived Nick as excessively assertive and overly self-assured, not aligning with Dawn's personality. Nick's upbringing paralleled Dawn's in some ways. He was born and raised in Washington, but unlike her, he hailed from Polesbo, a coastal city in Washington. Nick also faced troubles within his family from a young age. His father, Dan, immersed in constant work as a mechanic, remained distant when home, neglecting family time and household responsibilities. Meanwhile, Sandra, his mother, juggled a home daycare and foster care, leaving Nick feeling neglected. He confided in friends, expressing a sense of being less favored than his siblings and even the foster kids, perceiving his mother's feelings toward him as hate. Struggling through his mother's prolonged bouts of depression and his emotionally distant father, Nick lacked emotional support or connection from his parents. Despite this isolation, Nick sought comfort in the Bible, finding solace and deepening his involvement in Christianity. While his faith bolstered his self-assurance during his adolescence, it occasionally distanced him from others due to his newfound confidence. Nick and Don crossed paths for the first time at their shared college. Don's friends found it strange that she would take an interest in Nick, given his opposite traits as mentioned earlier. With time, they began noticing a change in Don. She had always displayed confidence through her extrovert nature, was always self-sufficient, consistently driven and striving to conquer new goals. However, in Nick's presence, everything seemed to be the other way around. She became timid, withdrawn, and indecisive, frequently deferring to Nick's choices, even if they clashed with her preferences or made her uncomfortable. It appeared as though Nick had a negative influence on her, contrary to bringing out her best self. Despite this, their love endured, and their relationship persisted, eventually ending up in an engagement after Nick proposed on Alki Beach in 1990. They sealed their commitment with marriage on April 20th, 1991, subsequently moving back to Bremerton. At that point, both had completed their degrees. 
Don secured a position as a loan officer, while Nick embarked on his role as a youth pastor at Christ Community Church on Bainbridge Island, situated across the bay from Seattle. Nick had aspired to become a youth pastor, specifically targeting Christ Community Church due to his bond with his former youth pastor, Bob, also known as P.B. Smith. At that time, P.B. Smith remained with the church, having overseen its affairs since the late 1980s, but had now partnered with Pastor Robert Billy Craig in guiding the congregation. P.B. Smith adopted a more amiable, yet conservative approach to church leadership, whereas Pastor Robert was known for his stringent and radical teachings. Throughout their marriage, Nick consistently made decisions without any opposition from Don. Why was that the case, though? Well, both Nick and Don adhered to Christian fundamentalism, a community where the wife is expected to submit to her husband's authority, believing it aligns with God's plan. At Christ Community Church, this ideology was explicitly promoted and deemed acceptable. The church even practiced exorcisms on afflicted members, advocated for families to have as many children as deemed by God, and endorsed homeschooling for these children. Their teachings emphasized women's modesty and addressed uncomfortable inquiries about sex. Speaking out against these norms risked excommunication from the church, fostering a climate of silence among dissenters, driven by fear of expulsion. Dawn and the congregation found themselves entrenched in what many would label a cult, with her husband Nick playing a pivotal role in the perilous practices. Nick had shifted his admiration toward Robert and sought direct mentorship under him, steering away from his initial close relationship with P.B. Smith. Dissatisfied with Smith's more relaxed approach, Nick felt he wasn't learning enough and disapproved of what he perceived as leniency, favoring the stringent and extreme methods of Pastor Robert. On the other hand, Robert viewed Nick as a means to accomplish his agenda, ousting Smith and assuming complete control as the senior pastor of the church. By 1997, Don and Nick had encountered home-related issues as they frequently relocated, residing in properties they refurbished to sell. Don yearned to establish a family and settle into a permanent residence. To address this, Nick found a fixer-upper in East Bremerton, intending for them to move in, renovate, and make it their home. However, the home purchase, renovations, and their house-flipping venture had pushed the couple into debt. Although their outward appearance showcased a seemingly flawless relationship, with Dawn portrayed as the supportive wife accommodating Nick's desires, underlying issues existed far beyond anyone's perception. Dawn had even made a request jokingly to a friend about potentially living with her instead of returning to her parents in case she and Nick ended their relationship. Meanwhile, Nick continued accumulating debt by regularly loaning money to fellow church members. He embarked on his ambitious venture, establishing a Christian youth camp. This endeavor, predictably, proved to be financially burdensome. However, fueled by his fervent desire, he fully committed to the project. He even began scouting properties in Jefferson County, convinced that one of these would serve as the perfect location for the camp. His determination intensified when a congregant, a woman named Sandy Glass, asserted receiving a divine vision, affirming that the property Nick had his eye on was destined to become the site of the youth camp he envisioned. Sandy Glass, who was in her 20s, had already faced considerable hardships in her life. Her first boyfriend had passed away due to an unspecified illness, while her father succumbed to a construction accident. Additionally, her brother battled with addiction. Sandy was married to a man named Jimmy. Their financial situation had been strained for some time. They relied solely on Jimmy's income as a carpenter, with Sandy staying home to care for their children. Similar to Nick, Sandy struggled with reckless spending habits, often exceeding their means, resulting in frequent arguments between her and Jimmy. These disputes sometimes led Jimmy to express his frustration through yelling or by withdrawing himself from the situation and spending hours at the bar. In a bid to address their marital conflicts, the couple sought help from the church and began attending marriage counseling sessions which were facilitated by Nick. At this point, Nick had served as the church's marriage counselor for several years. Many congregants had lodged complaints with Robert about Nick's counseling style, expressing discomfort over his tendency to focus predominantly on intimate inquiries, often dismissing other crucial issues. It appeared that discussions primarily revolved around matters of a sexual nature, neglecting other significant aspects. However, Owing to the trust they had in P.B. Smith, 
who was still affiliated with the church. Members presumed that Nick's role wouldn't be entrusted if he wasn't credible. However, by the fall of 1997, Pastor Robert had successfully displaced Smith, assuming the role of senior pastor, a decision fully endorsed by the church board. Smith and his wife then departed for Africa to engage in missionary work. Jimmy's parents, who were church attendees themselves, had viewed Sandy and Jimmy seeking church intervention as a hasty decision. They even questioned Nick's qualifications and experience in guiding their son's marriage. Their concerns deepened when Nick exhibited a conspicuous focus on Sandy individually rather than on the couple as a unit. This heightened attention extended beyond counseling sessions, leading to prolonged phone conversations and an excessive amount of time spent together both at church and even outside the church's surroundings. Jimmy's parents deemed the dynamic between Nick and Sandy as inappropriate, noting their extended interactions and increased closeness, which seemed to surpass the boundaries of a typical counselor-client relationship. Pastor Robert's wife, Pamela, had taken notice of Nick's conduct and had a private conversation with him, expressing concerns about his inappropriate behavior and advising him to focus on his own marriage. Following numerous complaints, Robert intervened, cautioning Sandy that her relationship with Nick was unacceptable and needed to cease. Sandy, feeling a sense of divine connection between her and Nick, reacted angrily to Robert's counsel. She wrote him a letter expressing her discontent, stating, The judgment I feel from you makes it hard for me to believe that you accept my gifts at all or that you have any confidence in my ability to hear God and use this to help anyone. The relationship between Sandy and Nick was already negatively impacting those around them. Don and Jimmy, along with his children from his marriage to Sandy, felt hurt. In fact, one of their children confided in Jimmy, revealing that Nick and Sandy had mentioned Nick becoming their new father when Jimmy died. At church, Dawn started sharing her distress with friends, revealing her financial turmoil and her earnest desire to have children, a wish Nick vehemently opposed. As 1997 drew to a close, Nick engaged in relationships with multiple women besides Sandy. He was seen engaging in private conversations and prolonged phone calls with these women. Simultaneously, Sandy's purported visions intensified, urging Nick to prioritize the establishment of his youth camp and to allocate more time to their relationship as she believed they were destined to be together. Dawn, on the contrary, made numerous efforts to rekindle Nick's happiness with her, even going to the lengths of attempting to lose some weight. Certain women within the congregation endeavored to console her, affirming that the issues between her and Nick were not a result of her actions, but rather stemmed from Nick himself being the core problem. Regrettably, her life hadn't unfolded as she had envisioned when she entered into marriage with him. Fast forward to Christmas, Dawn woke up feeling under the weather. Despite being sick with a cold, she and Nick visited her family, spending the whole day together. Later, in the evening, they headed to P.B. Smith's residence, joining his family for some time. Plans were set for Nick to go hunting with Lindsay, Smith's daughter, and her friends the following morning. On the 26th, just before dawn, Nick met up with his companions at Hood Canal Bridge in Jefferson County for the hunting trip. After spending a few hours in the woods without firing a single shot, they decided to leave and headed to a local diner for breakfast around 9 a.m. While everyone was eating, Nick suddenly stood up, appearing concerned, and exclaimed, Dawn and I haven't opened our Christmas presents. Around 9.30 a.m., Nick departed from the diner and returned home by 10 a.m., only to discover the tragic news of his wife's demise in a fire. Investigators revealed that the fire initially remained contained in the bedroom, sparked by a malfunctioning space heater. The inferno rapidly escalated due to the presence of newspapers and wrapping paper within the room, worsened by the multiple propane containers on the floor. Strangely, despite Nick informing his friends at the diner less than an hour earlier that they hadn't yet opened their Christmas gifts, he informed the authorities that they had indeed opened presents the previous night. He explained that due to Dawn feeling unwell, she retired to bed without tidying up the wrapping paper. Additionally, Nick claimed to have received the propane tanks as a Christmas gift. The couple's ongoing home renovations had led them to rely on space heaters during the winter. Back then, such heaters lacked the safety features seen in modern versions, which resulted in frequent fires and fatalities. Police found no discrepancies in Nick's account. Being a local pastor as well, Nick's standing in the community left law enforcement with no reason to suspect anything other than an accidental death for his wife. Concerned for their pastor's well-being, 
Nick's congregation sought ways to support him during what they believed was an immensely challenging time. Pastor Robert even proposed attempting to resurrect Dawn through prayer, but Nick declined, citing his wish to spare her any potential pain. This refusal surprised Robert, given Nick's prior willingness to engage in church activities, including the exorcisms they had previously attempted. Mary Glass, Sandra's mother-in-law, harbored immediate suspicions about Nick's involvement in Dawn's death, convinced it wasn't accidental. She urged her husband to approach the police, but this never materialized. Within days, Dawn's death was officially labeled accidental, and the Bremerton police relinquished the case to Nick's insurance company. Nick had already submitted a request to process Dawn's life insurance policy. Family and friends found it peculiar that Nick was dealing with the life insurance so swiftly after Dawn's passing. However, considering the couple's substantial debt and Nick's aspirations for the youth camp, they rationalized his urgency for the money. Some church members found Nick's grieving methods rather unusual, but they refrained from expressing concerns, assuming that everyone copes differently with grief. The church community organized a celebration of life event, serving as Dawn's funeral, where family and friends gathered to share stories and commemorate her life amid their sorrow. Nick remained entirely composed throughout the funeral, and even delivered a 45-minute eulogy. Friends assisting in tidying his home stumbled upon photos of Dawn tucked away at the back of a closet, which seemed as if he wanted to discard them. Subsequently, Nick displayed a harsh and insensitive attitude, not just towards some church members, but also to neighbors and friends. Beyond maintaining multiple relationships with women from the congregation, Nick shockingly engaged in an intimate relationship with Diana, Dawn's own mother, under the pretense of mourning as a widower. Nick's behavior had become intolerable even for Pastor Robert, resulting in Nick being asked to depart from Christ Community Church. This expulsion proved to be a significant blow to Nick, marking the outset of his escalating troubles. On April 10, 2001, Sandy, accompanied by her lawyer, met with the county district attorney and received an immunity offer in exchange for her testimony regarding a long-held secret dating back to the morning of December 26, 1997. According to Sandy, on the morning of Dawn's demise, Nick allegedly contacted her and confessed, saying, I did it. However, their conversation was abruptly interrupted by another incoming call on Sandy's phone. Putting Nick on hold to answer the call from somebody from the church who informed her about Dawn's incident, Sandy later returned to her conversation with Nick, seeking clarification on what he meant, but Nick only reiterated, It's done. It's done. Sandy refrained from pressing for more details about the call for several weeks afterward. Eventually, when Sandy confronted Nick, he confessed to administering a substantial overdose of Benadryl to Dawn and suffocating her by placing a plastic bag over her face. The heartbreaking aspect is that Dawn remained partially conscious, witnessing her husband suffocating her through the plastic bag. After ensuring she was no longer alive, he strategically arranged old newspapers and wrapping paper around the room, positioning them beneath her body, and positioned the propane tanks near the bed. He arranged the heater to in a way that it would start a fire, intending to obliterate any evidence of a crime, and instead staged the incident as an accidental fire. Dawn's autopsy findings indicated an absence of soot or carbon monoxide in her lungs and blood. The pathologist in charge of Dawn's examination attributed her death to an accidental fire and overlooked crucial evidence regarding carbon monoxide's adherence to red blood cells. This oversight led them to conclude, given Dawn was a pastor's wife, foul play wasn't involved, neglecting to convey that carbon monoxide attaches to red blood cells, implicating the absence of breathing during the incident. Despite an overdose of five times the normal amount of Benadryl, it was deemed insufficient to cause respiratory failure. The pathologist dismissed the possibility, suggesting Dawn, even in a drowsy state, would have reacted to the rising heat. Notably, crime scene photos revealed newspapers beneath Dawn's body, an unsettling detail that went largely unnoticed. While a fire marshal raised suspicions and conversed with the police, the ultimate decision regarding the accidental nature of Dawn's death didn't fall within his jurisdiction. Nick was arrested on September 12, 2001 at a Kinko's parking lot, where he staunchly denied any involvement in Dawn's death, attributing his arrest to the church's attempts at sabotage. Despite his assertions that the church members could inflict substantial harm, Nick faced first-degree murder charges with bail set at $750,000, 
Sandy's narrative, as conveyed to investigators, appeared bizarre, adding to the frustration stemming from the nearly four-year delay in considering Nick as a suspect or making an arrest. Her reason for cooperating was equally exasperating, driven by anger over Nick's involvement with other women from the church and feeling exploited. According to Sandy, at that point she concluded that God disapproved of their relationship, consequently implying that Dawn's murder was against divine will as well. Church members, when questioned, recounted Nick's peculiar behaviors and inappropriate relationships, expressing dismay over his failure to even purchase a headstone for Dawn's grave following the life insurance payout. On September 17, 2001, Nick appeared before a judge and entered a plea of not guilty. He asserted that his church had cast a curse upon him, alleging that Pastor Robert possessed a malevolent influence far darker than comprehensible by the police. Nick's trial commenced, prompting a modification in the charges due to the prosecutor's doubts regarding the judge's inclination toward the death penalty initially sought with the charge of first-degree murder. The charges were amended to aggravated first-degree murder, carrying a sentence of life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. The alteration in charges stemmed from the arson Nick had committed, enabling this revised charge. Witnesses, including the women who were involved with Nick and various church members who had undergone counseling with him, provided testimonies that illuminated Nick's conduct to the jury. These accounts shed light on the significant influence wielded by the church in their lives. They detailed experiences of purported visions and direct messages believed to be from God, exploited by Nick for rationalization and manipulation. Smith's daughter testified, recounting her introduction to Nick through her father and how Nick had groomed her during her teenage years. Their sexual involvement ensued shortly after Dawn's death and persisted until she eventually relocated about a year later. Doctors and forensic experts also testified, emphasizing that Dawn's body held vital clues regarding the events of that day. However, these indicators were overlooked as mentioned earlier, due to Nick's status as a pastor, despite the abnormal absence of soot and carbon monoxide for someone who was alive and breathing during a fire. The defense vehemently contested these allegations, focusing efforts on framing Sandy as the jealous, vengeful ex-partner fabricating accusations upon discovering Nick's infidelity with various women. Nonetheless, on December 26, 2002, five years post-Dawn's tragic demise, the jury deliberated for a mere day before delivering a guilty verdict for aggravated first-degree murder against Nick. During the subsequent sentencing on February 7, 2003, Nick addressed the courtroom, comprising Dawn's friends and family, vehemently maintaining his innocence while expressing remorse for his actions and expressing sorrow over their loss, acknowledging Dawn deserved better. Nick received a life sentence. However, in 2007, an appeal to the state Supreme Court led to a revision of his life sentence. The appeal contended that since Dawn had already perished due to Nick suffocating her, the original charge of aggravated first-degree murder pertaining to death by arson didn't align with her actual cause of death. The defense argued that Nick therefore didn't deserve a life sentence, Ultimately, the state Supreme Court ruled in favor of the appeal, altering Nick's sentence to 26 years in prison. While in prison, Nick has actively supported educational initiatives and co-founded the Environmental Advancement Reintegration Network. He initiated a waste management system, employing worm composting, and even delivered a TED Talk centered on sustainability. Unfortunately, it is indicated that he will become eligible for parole in 2025, and could potentially be released soon. Dawn, gone soon, but not forgotten. Unfortunately, the life she had pictured with whom she believed was the one didn't turn out to be the actual reality, and sadly in the process led to the ultimate betrayal and her heartbreaking and untimely demise. Our heartfelt prayers and thoughts extend to her departed soul and the loved ones she left behind. If you found this video compelling, be sure to like and subscribe to our channel and check out our other videos. Thank you for watching.